when they come for us. We are, as they say, long in the tooth. We sit in armchairs and watch repeats of crime dramas or read the finance section of the newspaper, the real newspaper, and discard everything else without looking. We eat meat even though our long teeth cannot chew it. We do so out of principle and because there has to be a use for the silver steak knives. When they come for us, we are in our houses, our real houses, and the sound is up high and the heat is up high for our bones, which are never warm, not ever, not even when the heat is up high and they can't possibly understand that, the need to burn, to try. When they come for us, the sounds of storms crash through the orange trees of our youth and the warm air is sucked outside to shiver with their shouts, getting closer like thunder. But it was like this, we had done everything for them. Some of us had found new uses for tin soup, learned to drink the cabbage water, cut coupons from magazines and driven miles to use them. Some of us had dug and when the banks had come calling, we had scraped deeper and deeper into the earth. Some of us might have been the banks. Others had spread the ink of a highlighter through the fibres of the stocks pages, and this was for their future too. How couldn't it be? Always we were thinking. We had our real houses and we multiplied them because we could, because we were told that we should, and then we divided them again until we had so much more than our childhoods promised and they had somewhere too. They sat there in multitudinous fractions on sofas. On the sofas, too close to each other, they read unfathomable words that whipped the air in their lungs and sent them here, to a stone crack in a window, to the shore of some terrible island. There was a feeling amongst us that we couldn't stay here on our armchairs and they couldn't stay there on sofas which had, in any case, broken. There was a feeling, or else it was a noise, which caused us to close ranks, to jam wax into our ears and push the sound up high. They had told us that it was not enough, neither were we. And when the first brick lands like a dead bird, we realise, or at least some of us do, that they are, in a way, right, or at least they have a right for the noise to be heard. They are slicing open the bellies of our real houses now. We can see them, and it is difficult not to recognise something of our own noses, our foreheads, our chins, illuminated in the blue light of the television. A girl, all lines and angles, whirls around in the expanses of our living rooms and smashes ornaments with a sharpened tent peg. We do not stop her. A happy girl, we say. Excitable. A boy, our own steak knife against our throats, speaks a story that is strange to us. He tells of empty houses, trees growing through cracks in the windows, lights left on and smudging the night. Bed bugs crawling from the pages of books and mould creeping up walls. People in the underpass, tents blazing and pissed on while behind glass the Swiss cheese plant lives, its ribs nuzzled by the alternately chilled and warmed air of an AC unit. On the television, a balding man is placing a hairdryer in the bathtub. We offer wine from Chile, chocolate from Colombia. We offer to fry a chop from the, for them each, flown from New Zealand. Another child, emerging from darkness with a pebble in, in hand, tells us to stop. Our time for talking is done. There will be, the smallest one says, a reclaiming, a, re a rewilding. They start levering up carpets as if they are trying to get at the earth. The girl tells us that soon there will be no worms working the soil down with their little mouths, no moles eating the worms and churning the soil, nothing growing. She says our greenhouses are a joke. If we had caged birds, we don't anymore. They are tiny sparks in the night, fragments of flowers. Our dogs are barking or else whimpering or else their bellies are bare to the children who rub them and smile. While we are not scared, there are many of us, and we have sailed and flew and fought, some of us. The question trembles in our minds of whether they will feed our own livers to the dogs once they have finished. Our cats are nowhere to be seen. When the televisions go, there is little need for us to be awake, and sleep falls fast, but only in flashes. We fumble in the darkness for blankets, then wake sweating from red dreams to cast them off. Morning light jolts us awake, and our dogs and the three children have gone, but a fourth, so young, a bundle of soft bones, sits in the middle of the room. His flesh is pink and raw, like a wound reopened against the 
spare floorboards and it yearns for us to lift him up onto the armchairs. Cocoon him on our soft stomachs and crane our necks to meet his face which is cracking open in a, into a wet pink smile, revealing a glimpse of an off-white tooth nestled in the centre of his lower gum, then widening to take us in, then creasing all over, pupils swelling, swelling and narrowing and drifting between our faces so fast it is impossible to know what is seen in each moment, what is needed. He giggles and kicks with his left leg and we see that there is a piece of brown paper attached with a string around his ankle. A gift, the note says, and if we care for him, we too shall be cared for, as if this is how gifts work, as if this is how care works, as if this was the logic of the soup cans and the cabbage water. But the boy's crown smells of sugared milk and he does not know any of this. We hold him close. They will return in five days. On the first day, we wake to find we have little food. While we were asleep, they filled sacks with the contents of our allotments, took the fine cheeses and preserves, the eggs of hens and ducks and quails, but we boiled the remaining apples to mush and soaked stale bread in milk and sugar. In the early afternoon, he begins to eat fingernail-sized mouthfuls, but later he gurgles and shivers, vomits, cries for hours. To stop his tiny features from twisting with so much violence, to hold in the initial scream that seems to rip through walls, we wipe clean his soured skin and wrap him in warm towels, piece together some of the smashed ornaments with glue and dangle them on string before his always changing face and plug the windows with old jumpers. All are useless. The wind finds the gaps. And when in the night the foxes scream like victims, echoes of the television, he screams with them. On the second day, we open a tin of sweet rice and try to mash a dry clementine to pulp. The child burps it out. On this day, we try to soothe him with passages from the finance pages, or from the supermarket magazine, or from the collected po poems of Alfred Lord Tennyson, but our ears do not rest. With the television gone, there is little to do except hold the child and look to each other, but we find that we are dwindling. We are forced to cut new holes in our belts, twisting with the points of the few remaining steak knives until a sharp glimmer pokes through the other side. When we try to phone the tailor with new measurements, no one answers, and we receive no visitors. At night, the sounds of beasts magnify. We swear we can hear howls and grunts of things long since hunted to nothing, while it seems that the other lights in our cul-de-sacs are flickering out, the hum of human life muting. Cold, black air creeps through the cracks and shows up in the child's mucus on the third day. His breath falters. It is not clear that he wants to live. It might be a kindness to squeeze him until the air stops, but we fear the return of the children's ragged eyes. This time, when we try to bathe his body and ours, the taps make a deep gargle and can't summon anything to spit into the tubs, so we wet flannels with rain and soap and rub the greyish milk over the child who spits, arches his back, and covers his face with two clenched fists. He has not laughed since we first took him from the floor, and we wonder if this is where the years of resentment start building in the bones of a baby, unable to identify intentions behind actions. We gasp from the effort of lifting him out of the tub. Every action feels heavy, and as we look among ourselves, we see that we are becoming fewer and fewer. On the fourth day, we are woken by a crow scattering around the insides of the houses, squawking at the child until he is choking for oxygen again. He has found a fever, scratched to a red rawness bite we hadn't seen before, and thrown up dark bile where the carpets were lifted and ripped away, where something has taken root in the gaps. It takes hours and so much strength to expel the crow that dinner feels sweet and perfect on our tongues. A return of tin soup, condensed milk, fruit cocktail and syrup from the deepest edges of the cupboards, enveloping us in dreams of our old bank accounts growing fat as a baby, the lush green vertices of golf courses, slick from sprinklers, the sleek flight of a speeding car, and then a cry so harsh it tears a hole in the asphalt and we wake to the child blue and bawling. We can see what you have made of our gift, the boy says, placing himself on an armchair. Our protests cannot surface 
because their voices are so much louder than ours now, deeper, and they enter accompanied by, an, by impossible animals. A bobcat lounges at the girl's feet. A wolf stretches out in the spot where our dogs once did. A bear lumbers ridiculously through the patio doors, shattering glass. It is no longer easy to call them children. The smallest of the three holds a brick in each hand and muscles ripple along his arms. We can see that you are no longer many, he says. Not only this, our teeth have scattered in a circle around us and been replaced by pink gum and a single milky pebble. Our ears have shrunk to two quivering question marks. Our shirt sleeves have fallen far past our hands and the watch must have slipped. The wrists bare, soft, hairless. The sound of the child's cry rings out still, closer, as if the sound has become so familiar it has been internalised and rips out of our own body. On the coarse floorboards, a pair of crumpled trousers, a useless belt lump looped around, flesh wriggling and screaming against the howling, the encroaching thunder, while vision softens so the children seem so many and it is difficult to saw eyes from noses, ears, chins, snouts. Wind tears through flesh into bone, and I cannot speak now, to ask, to try, but only reach for the same wordless noise.